Genesis 37.1. And when you got that, also put another finger in Genesis 45. Reaches us, Genesis 37, 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. Now, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now if you would turn with me to chapter 45, verse 4, 45, verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. The last place is Exodus, the first chapter. Exodus, the first chapter, the eighth verse. Exodus, the first chapter, the eighth verse. And it reads, Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly with them, and they will become even more numerous. And if, we, if wars break out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. Brothers and my sisters, I ask that you would join me in a word of prayer um, as we share on the sermon subject, it's your time. It's your time. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's your time. And turn to somebody else and say, neighbor, you're the one. You're the one. You're the one. It's your time. Well, you're the one. Let us look to the Lord God in Jesus' name. Do it. Amen. January the 15th, 1817, January the 15th, 1817, 200 years ago, uh, almost to this month, uh, that you saw a gathering of over 200 freed black people uh, in Philadelphia at the Bethel AME Church. The Bethel AME Church, you saw a gathering of 200 freed uh, black people at the Bethel AME Church, and, and it was a meeting because they were meeting with the American Colonization Society. The American Colonization Society was an organization in the United States uh, that was trying to get those people who were freed slaves to be able to go back to Africa. Uh, they had pitched, pitched to them a, a, a potential opportunity to be able to go and to colonize Western Africa. Uh, they pitched them this opportunity, uh, these 200 freed people, these great leaders, uh, these freed leaders, uh, they pitched them the opportunity uh, to be able to go back to Western Africa and colonize Western Africa. It's an interesting thing because what you find is the statement of these folks uh, in what is now considered the very first civil rights meeting in American history and what you find is these freed slaves these folks who had worked or fought for or gotten away to freedom uh, in this meeting uh, decide to make this statement and they said that whereas our ancestors not a not of choice were the first successful cultivators of the wilds of America. We, their descendants, feel ourselves entitled to participate in the blessings of her luxuriant soil. We will never separate ourselves voluntarily from the slave population of this country. They are our brethren by the ties of consanguinity, of suffering, and of wrong. It's a very interesting thing because what you watched in that moment was that you had people who were free, who had opportunity, but who decided we will not leave our brothers and sisters as long as they're in slavery, but we will do everything we can to help them to see a brighter day. 
It's an interesting thing, my brothers and my sisters, because if you may never know any of their names, but you will see that this was one of the first civil rights of meetings ever held in the United States in which people who had opportunity and possibility could have left those who were left fortunate, but they said, as long as one of us is a slave, I'll have to work to be able to make sure that all of us are free. And I've come by to talk to you all today because uh, during this Black History Month, you need to understand uh, that it is for all of us to be able to be used to make this world a better place. It is on all of us to be able to make humanity a better place. And I don't care where you stand politically or ideologically, it is for all of us to make sure that when we leave this world, the world is better than when we came. And so I've come by to talk to you about this gentleman by the name of Joseph, a gentleman who found himself in the midst of a bad situation but trying to make the world a bit better. Now let me help you. Joseph is a guy who you hear about in Sunday school a lot. They talk about him as a guy with a coat of many colors. Uh, he had a father by the name of Jacob. His father Jacob uh, loved him more than he loved all of his brothers. His brothers got so upset that his brother set J Joseph up one day. Uh, they set him up one day and they threw him into a pit. They were about to kill him, but instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. He was sold into slavery, ended up working in a place a gentleman named Potiphar's house worked in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife uh, wanted to be with him, but he wanted to live righteously and so therefore she accused him of rape falsely and he ended up in jail. Ended up in jail while in jail he was able uh, to sit there and interpret some folks dreams and out of jail uh, when the Pharaoh had an issue of needing a dream interpreted now he called for Joseph and Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and was able to tell him there was going to be a famine coming up on the land and as he told them about the famine that was going to be coming up on the land he was able to help him understand and become Ooh, that's painful. We're just going to let that get worked out. I think that was the right button. Amen? Amen. Can I get this monitor back, though? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. Y'all have made me look bad in front of Dr. Andrews. Dag nab it. I'm embarrassed. Y'all know I don't get embarrassed. Amen, Dr. Andrews. You know I get. Dr. Andrews, aren't you happy I wore a suit for you today, though? Because you know I don't wear suits on Sundays, right? Okay, I just wanted to let y'all know. Yeah, so y'all know, I don't wear suits on Sundays. This is my good Dr. Andrew's suit, amen? So that I could be impressive today, amen? And now back to your regularly scheduled programming. And so my brothers and my sisters, what we find is... And so what you find is that here goes Joshua. Joshua has been able to interpret the king's dream. Joshua becomes a second in command. I'm sorry, Joseph. Thank you so much. Joseph has become the second in command of all of Egypt. And here he is, a brother who was in a pit, now is in what? The palace. One of the first things I want you to understand, if you understand anything along this journey, that you've got to understand that your dreams never die. Turn to your neighbor and say, your dreams never die. Your dreams, your, your, your dreams never die. What do you mean, Reverend, your dreams never die? I, I mean that if you look at Joseph, Joseph had dreams that his brothers got upset about. They end up putting him in a pit because of his dreams, but his pit couldn't kill his dreams. Uh, he ended up in a prison in spite of that, but his prison couldn't kill his dreams. That, that no matter what he was going through, he still still lived righteously wherever he was because he knew it couldn't what? Kill his dreams. And I've come by to tell you that no matter what your situation, you keep on living right because God will still take care of you. That no matter what you're going through, no matter your circumstance, that you keep on trying to live for the Lord and God will still what? Take care of you. If you look at it, that he could have had it easier if he had just done the wrong thing with part of his wife, but he still wanted to do right by God because he still had dreams on the inside. And when he did right by God, that God took care of him because no matter where you are, it can't kill your dreams. Turn to somebody and say, uh, your dreams don't die. That, that if God gave it to you, then God can work it out. That if God told you that you would be there, God can make you somebody. That if God gave you a bright hope and a bright destiny, then God can work it out. That I don't care what your situation, I don't care what your mistake, I don't care what your challenge, I don't care what your concern, but God is still able in the midst of it all to work on your behalf. Have I got a witness in the house today? Is there anybody from Oxon Hill High School who knows if you got a dream of graduation that God can help you get up out of there? If you got a dream of college that God can get you through college, you got a dream of your own business that God can get you through your own business, and I don't care what anybody says around you, you've got to know that the Lord made you to be able to be somebody up along your way. I got anybody in here that can shop for us and your high school student who you believe is going to be somebody? Is there anybody in the house today that knows that nothing, 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 
can kill your dreams. Nothing can kill your dreams. I'm going to preach this quick because we got high school students and they got to go get something to eat. The second thing you've got to understand, second thing you've got to understand is that beef expires. Turn to your neighbor and say, beef expires. Beef, beef expires. Beef expires. Dr. Andrews was an interesting thing. This has been an interesting month that we've experienced the first month of a brand new president. There's been all kinds of news all over the place. I'm talking about every day it seems about five new news stories. I mean every day that just something new is happening whether uh, you've got folks being elected to different positions or appointed to different positions but every day there's something new happening but yesterday it amazed me because of all the different kinds of things happening in the news. You could have dealt with the fact that uh, he had kicked folks that was decided he wasn't going to the correspondence dinner. You uh, could have dealt with the fact that President Trump had decided to keep certain news uh, 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 companies up out uh, of the briefing. Or you could have dealt with the fact that the DNC ended up electing a new a new head, a new chair. You could have dealt with all of that. But out of all of that, out of all the news that was swirling around us, uh, the biggest news story that caught the biggest traction uh, was Remy Ma beefing with Nicki Minaj. Uh, it was Remy Ma beefing with Nicki Minaj. I, I know I got some help up in here. Y'all shouted too hard. Amen, somebody. Uh, Shouted to 200. And Remy Ma, Remy Ma beefing with. What happened? Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj decided to go um, and throw some shade at, at, at Remy Ma in one of her songs and, and a couple of verses in the joint. And so Remy Ma came back. Now Nicki forgot that Remy Ma had been in jail for a, a, a grip. Amen, somebody. And, and she ain't had nothing to do up in there but work on her skills. Amen. And, and Remy Ma came with a seven minute opus. Amen, somebody. I'm talking about a seven minute, uh, one fifth. 15 second, a thriller in Manila, killer gorilla. I'm tearing everything down up in here, up in here. Get down with the get down, boogie down Bronx, old school joint. Amen, somebody. See, it, it was amazing. And, and, so, and so what got me was that it brought me back to the days of old school beef. Amen. It brought me back to the days of old school hip hop. Old school hip hop in which you had artists that would battle it out, but they would battle it out on wax. They would battle it out with the microphones. They would battle it out. And you saw these artists coming at each other. Now, I'm not telling any of y'all, amen, somebody, to go. And don't say the Reverend Lee told you to go listen to it. Amen. Reverend Lee did not tell you to go listen to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Run far from it. Amen somebody. Uh, but, but it's interesting because what you have is these two sisters uh, are having this having this artistic beef in which they're going at each other. And it, and it reminded me of old school beefs. It reminded me of, 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 of Roxanne Shante. You know what I'm saying? It reminded me of, of KRS-One, The Bridge is Over. You know what I'm saying? It reminded me of like these old school hip-hop beefs. It, it reminded me Cool Mo DB or, or LL Cool J. I mean, it reminded me of all these old beefs that we saw that were handled on the microphone. It was it amazed me, but, but as I sat and I reflected upon it, I realized uh, that, that even in all of this and even looking at uh, Joseph, it reminded me the fact that beef expires, that beef expires. And when you don't understand that beef has an expiration date, huh, uh, then that's when you can play yourself out of position huh, and put yourself in a bad situation. What do you mean, Reverend Well? Uh, uh, one of the things I learned, and I appreciated old school hip hop because we had ways of handling beef, uh, but then when it got a little fresher and up into, uh, uh, into the whole gangster rap, era uh, that we took beef and made it personal. Amen. Somebody beef uh, got uh, off of, uh, of the records and into the streets. And so what we found was uh, uh, that it ended up being an East Coast, West Coast beef. We found that we lost two good brothers, Tupac and Biggie, as a result of the beef that ended up not understanding that beef was supposed to be something that was just handled on the wax, uh, but it ended up going longer than it needed to go. Lord have mercy. And it ended up uh, expiring. Uh, I don't understand. I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson and Joshua showed me this lesson. Joshua showed me this lesson because remember, it was Joshua's brothers who put him in the pit. It was Joshua's brothers who, uh, Joseph, why do I keep saying Joshua? It was Joseph's brothers who had him in jail. It was Joseph's brothers uh, uh, who had him uh, in a rough situation. Uh, but yet, Joseph ended up overrunning the whole game for Pharaoh. And when Joseph's brothers got there, Joseph ended up forgiving his brothers. I don't understand how Joseph would forgive his brothers. I didn't understand how Joseph would have the intestinal fortitude for people who sold you into slavery uh, to be able to say, I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to give you everything you need. I did not understand what would cause Joseph. And so I had to have a conversation with Joseph. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I went and had a conversation with Joseph. I said, Joseph, uh, how could you forgive your brothers uh, for all the hell they 
they put you through. And Joseph said, Reverend, remember you told them in the beginning that beef has an expiration date. And you need to remember. I said, oh, oh, I get it, I get it. He said, remember what you learned. And I remember that when I first got my first good apartment, when I first got my first apartment, I got my first apartment and I went to the grocery store and I got me some hamburger meat. I got some hamburger meat because I wanted to make sloppy joes. Anybody like sloppy joes? I wanted to, to be able to make me some good sloppy joes. Sloppy joes will do it for you, amen. I wanted to make me some sloppy joes and, and, and so I went and I got some hamburger meat. I took it home and I put it in the refrigerator because I wanted to get me some sloppy joes. But the problem was uh, that, that I didn't decide to cook that night and then uh, the next day I ended up hanging out and didn't decide to cook and the next day I got caught up at work and didn't decide to cook and then I ended up on a trip for my job and I was gone for about four or five days and I, I couldn't cook my hamburger meat and so when I got back from my trip uh, and I went into the refrigerator uh, because I wanted to make me some sloppy joes uh, I found out uh, that when I opened up the refrigerator uh, that thing stank so bad uh, and I didn't understand where this foul odor was coming from uh, but as I investigated it I realized uh, that my hamburger meat had spoiled uh, because it was past its expiration date. Uh, in other words, uh, it was beef, uh, but I could not leave the beef in there forever uh, because it had spoiled, uh, and spoiled beef uh, would make you sick. Uh, that when you have beef out too long, uh, it can make you sick, uh, and it can make everything else in the refrigerator uh, be spoiled as well. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, that, that I was sitting there, uh, and it had my whole house smelling. Uh, I was sitting there, uh, and I tried to reach for some other food, uh, but it had it smelling so bad uh, that it made everything in my refrigerator spoil uh, because I had not dealt with the fact uh, that beef, Lord have mercy, uh, has an expiration date. Uh, and I've come by to let you know uh, that that's what Joshua understood. Uh, that Joshua understood uh, that sometimes uh, you got to let the beef go. Uh, that sometimes uh, you can't hold on to the beef. Uh, that sometimes uh, there's some stuff going on in your life uh, that you can't keep holding on to it uh, because it will spoil uh, and mess everything else up. Uh, and I got somebody in the house uh, that knows what I'm talking about her. He goes, Joseph, his brothers did him wrong. But he said, I've got to forgive you so I can be a blessing to my daddy. Somebody in here, you've been going through some things and you've got some beef. But I've come by to let you know it's time to let the beef go. It's time to let it go and let God And let God work it out. Uh, beef has an expiration date. Uh, but the third thing that I'm a part of here uh, is you've got to understand uh, the decisions you make today uh, last for your tomorrow. Uh, the decisions you make today last for your tomorrow. I'm looking at Joseph. I've always been taught about Joseph. Uh, I've been taught about how great a guy he is. I've been taught about how amazing a guy he is. They always talk about him for perseverance. They talk about how he made it through the jail and how he made it through slavery and how he became second in command to Pharaoh and how he was such a smart person that he was able to help Pharaoh uh, to be able to save for seven years uh, of grain uh, so they could be able to weather the storm of the seven years of famine. There was an amazing story about Joseph. It was an amazing story about Joseph, about how he could be able to forgive his brothers who did him so wrong. It's an amazing story about Joseph. Uh, but Dr. Andrews, something bugs me uh, as I sat and I kept reading Joseph's story uh, because I've been taught all these wonderful things about Joseph. Uh, but I realized at the end of his story uh, that there was some something uh, that caused me to have concern uh, because his decisions uh, uh, lasted uh, uh, way past his life. Uh, and the thing that I've come by to tell at least a few folks uh, and a couple of students at Oxon Hill High School uh, is the decisions you make today uh, will impact who you become tomorrow. Uh, uh, what do you mean, Reverend? Uh, let me help you. Uh, when I look at Joseph, uh, in Joseph, uh, in the 47th chapter, uh, what you will find is that remember Joseph stored up all of this food uh, uh, because Egypt uh, was in the midst of a famine uh, and so everybody would have to come to Joseph uh, to be able to get some grain. Uh, and they said in one year they came uh, and they didn't have any money and they spent up all of their money uh, and so everyone spent all of their money uh, to be able to get grain from Joseph uh, and he gave them grain. Uh, they said the next year they came uh, and they didn't have any more money. Uh, he said you don't have any money. Uh, give me your livestock. 
rock. Give me your cattle. Everybody gave him all of their cattle. And Joseph then gave them the grain so they could be able to go and live. And they said the next year came and they didn't have any money. They didn't have any cattle. And they said all we have is land and all we have is ourselves. He said, well, sell yourselves and your land to me. And so the people made themselves slaves unto Pharaoh so they could get something to eat. And so Joseph brought all the people of Egypt and made them all into slaves. And all of their land was Pharaoh's. So Pharaoh had this whole nation of slave workers and he owned all of the land. But what blows my mind is that when you look at the way the story goes, the Bible says in Exodus that there came a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And what happened was that because Joseph had shaped the public policy of slavery, now there came a Pharaoh that didn't know about Joseph and put Joseph's people into slavery. You've got to be very careful about how you handle things when you've got power and influence because you've got to make sure that you take care of everybody and not just somebody. But what Joseph did, it's a horrible thing to me. He was a slave, but when he got power, he made people slaves. That he was on the outside, but now that he was working for Pharaoh, he did Pharaoh's dirty work. But I've come by to let you know, you've got to have integrity, not just when you broke, but when you're on the top side, not just when you don't have much, but you've got to do it, you've got to do it. When you have a whole bunch, and when somebody will say to me, Reverend, Reverend, I hear what you're saying, and you've got a whole group of young people here, but how in the world are you able to be so clear in the midst of situations that seem so murky? How in the world are you able always to make a decision that can connect to where you've got to go? And I told them, well, I'm going to tell you a lesson that I learned from my phone. I had my phone if you don't mind. I'll tell you a lesson. You see, I like playing a game on my phone called Pokemon Go. Y'all heard me talk about it. It's a game in which you sit and you hunt the Pokemon. Pocket Monsters. It's a game in which I can pull up the Pokemon and right now I can be looking through my video camera at the church. It'll show me the chairs. It'll show me the carpet. It'll show me the people. But it'll also show me where some Pokemon are that I can be able to catch. Other scientists call it augmented reality. That on the top of my current reality, there's something that you cannot see with your naked eye. That by yourself, you can't see I got Pokemon up in here. But when I look through my phone, it gives me a different version of reality on top of my current reality. What are you trying to say, Reverend? I'm trying to say that there's more to this world than meets the eye. The Bible says that we battle not against those things that are carnal, but we battle against spiritual things. But you've got to understand that there's more to your situation than meets the eye. And as long as you look at your situation with your earthly eyesight, you'll always do your earthly thing. But when you look at your situation in the eyes of faith, you'll know that the Lord can make a way somehow you can look at your wallet be broke as a joke but know that God is able to work it out for you have I got a witness in the house have I got somebody in the house that knows that in the midst of your situation you've got to see it for more than the way you see it my grandmama used to say I looked at my hands and my hands look new I looked at my feet and they did too. Have I got anybody in here that you see depression? But in the midst of it, I see joy. You see a problem. In the midst of it, I see potential. You see a challenge. In the midst of it, I see a celebration. Why? Because the Lord will make a way. Somehow, my grandmama, y'all know my grandmama, she 
you say he's a doctor where in the sick room you can't see nobody in the sick room but the worldly doctors but my grandma will see another doctor that had never lost a case say he was a lawyer in the courtroom all you can see is a judge and your public defender but God would have Jesus sitting right there by you you don't believe me ask Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they put them in a fiery furnace they thought it was only three but they was walking around and didn't smell like smoke and they said there's a fourth in there and he looks like the son of God you don't believe me ask Daniel up in the lion's den and the lions looked hungry but when he got in there they started fasting because the Lord was with him have I got anybody in here that God has made a way for you in the midst of it all late in the midnight hour that God will turn it around it's gonna work in your favor see ya See ya! Won't you stand all over the church all that are able?